Good Wednesday morning, everybody. Happy hump day. Pastor Rob here. Hope everybody's doing good. It's been a busy couple of days here. We've uh, got a funeral. Keep my friend Gary, if you don't mind, in prayer. His wife of 54 years passed away, and her funeral was this afternoon. So I pray for Gary and his family. Um, anyway, I hope everybody's good. I didn't do a lesson yesterday because of that, but... <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and start here in uh, lesson number 30 today. Lesson number 30 in the book of Mark. And we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31. This is where Peter tells Jesus he can't go to the cross or he doesn't want him to go to the cross. And Matthew and Luke both cover these, by the way. Matthew and uh, Matthew 16, Luke 9. And I think it's uh, good to read them all again so you have the, the bigger picture on what's going on. Um, so this is basically right after G, uh, Peter says, you are the Christ. We just had that lesson when Jesus says, who do you say I am? And when he says, you are the Christ. And remember, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. It only matters what you say. Say uh, remember to answer that question according to the word of God that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. He's our savior. He's our Lord. He came. He was crucified. He was buried and he rose again. And uh, someday we'll be with him in heaven. So now it's interesting that Peter had made that confession. And then here he's going to get um, disciplined by Jesus publicly in front of the disciples for uh, denying that he should go to the cross. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth as we get going. So. Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Jesus began to teach the people that the Son of Man, referring to himself obviously, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and then after three days rise again. So this is the first exposure. So let me go back a minute. There was a couple times where Jesus said to the disciples, don't go preach in my name. Well, it's because they didn't understand the plan of salvation yet. It just wasn't the right time and that, and that they hadn't been empowered by the Holy Spirit just yet. And so this is one of their first exposures to the uh, message of the cross, the message of salvation. They're starting to get an education on the gospel and now they'll be prepared to teach it. And as believers today, this is something we need to understand that Jesus knew his purpose even before time. First Peter 1.20 Titus 1, 2, and so on. There are several verses that cover that. That before time, the Son of Man was planned on coming to earth. And we'll look at that in a little greater depth as well. So they get their first exposure here to the gospel. Jesus Christ came for this purpose. He came for one purpose, not just to do miracles and to teach, but to go to the cross to redeem the human race, to bring the human race back to God. We were separated from God because of sin, and Jesus is going to bridge that gap through the cross, pay for our sins with his blood, put that blood on the mercy seat of heaven, and die one time for all mankind, once for all. So and you can read Hebrews on that. So um, he, basically Jesus is teaching that he must be killed. After three days he will rise again. Again, that refers again and, and, and coincides with the prophet Jonah that he talked about the sign that you'll receive as as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale. The Son of Man will be three days in the earth. And so, uh, verse 32, Mark chapter 8, he spoke plainly about this, very plainly. He wants these guys to understand. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I can't imagine being a man, uh, being Peter, being a person around Christ and grabbing him and saying, I need to talk to you. Uh, it's just interesting. That's Peter, though. We know, if you've read anything about Peter, he's very bold. He's very... Um, doesn't maybe have a filter like some of us may or may not have. So he grabs him and he rebukes Jesus. But when Jesus turned and he looked at his disciples, he wants the disciples to hear this message. Number one, he rebuked Peter. And then he says, get behind me, Satan. So this is a question. Did Satan get into uh, Peter's vocal cords? Was he being influenced by Satan in some way? Obviously, Satan got to Judas um, and we know that Jesus even tells Peter that the devil's trying to get you, uh, but he's preventing that. So we know that Peter was going to be, is in the future going to be very influential in the church. And if the devil can get him, he's made a significant 
uh, done some significant damage to Christ's ministry. So Peter says to Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. Jesus looks and says, get behind me, Satan. He knows that the devil is trying to influence Peter, you know. Uh, now, so Satan is not omnipresent. So he is going to go after the people who are going to have the most effect on the kingdom of God. So he's not going around omnipresent, you know, uh, influence a, a bunch of people. But he is going to go after the people that are going to have significant impact in the future. So he goes after Peter. He attacks Peter. Peter says, uh, you're not going to the cross, Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of, of God on your mind, but the things of men. Now I want to look, too, just for a side note. Look how many times, and this is just a couple here, that the devil tried to stop the uh, crucifixion of Christ. He tried to get in the way of Jesus Christ because he knows the plan. He was in heaven when the plan was formulated, uh, and he does not want the human race to come into uh, reconciliation with God. Uh, Satan, for some reason, does not want that. He hated that. And then he says in his beauty that he wanted to be and exalt himself above God. So he's going to try to damage this plan. And he did it in Eden, uh, becoming the snake. He was in the Garden of Eden. And you can read Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 on these two things as well, if you want to read more about Satan. But he's trying all he can do within his might to stop Christ from going to the cross, to stop the birth of Christ even, because he knows the plan and does not want the human race to be reconciled to God. He wants us all to be with him in misery and future. And he knows his destiny already. There's no secret about his destiny. So he tried to destroy the human race in Eden. He tried to destroy uh, Israel, the nation itself, through many attacks from, from the Philistines to the Edomites to the Amalekites to all these things that came against him. Actually, if you look at Re Revelation 12, if you have your Bible, I'm going to turn to Revelation 12 just briefly. There was war in heaven at one point. Uh, Revelation 12, where the devil tried to defeat uh, uh, heaven, exalt himself to the throne. and But what we learn is that he couldn't even overcome Michael the archangel, let alone Christ, who they're in no way in comparison. So Michael and the devil might be equal, or Lucifer might be equal, but Christ is far above each one, exceeds all of them. And it says that uh, there was war in heaven, Revelation 12, 7. <clears throat> Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Uh, and so if you looked at like Luke 10, 18, Jesus says, I saw the devil hurled from heaven. So Luke 10, 18, Revelation 12, there was war in heaven. Also, if you look at Revelation 12 in verse four, this is where we get the Satan took the third of the angels. It says his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So he takes a third of the angels with him. The dragon stood in front of the woman. Now, this would be Israel. She wants to do, he wants to devour the child. He wants to destroy uh, Jesus Christ before he can even have any ministry on earth. He stood in front of the woman. That could be the nation of Israel, but you could also say that right after she gave, Mary gave birth, remember Herod tried to kill all children, two and under. So there's another attempt to stop Christ from going to the cross. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment <clears throat> it had been born. And so you can read Revelation 12 on it, but the devil is constantly trying to get Jesus from going to the cross. Matthew 4 and Luke 4, remember when the when Jesus is fasting, beginning his ministry, the devil comes to him, remember, not omnipresent, but he goes to significant figures, Peter, Christ, and he tries to get the, Jesus to worship him because he knows if Jesus worships him or uses his power on earth for himself, that he would be disqualified from going to the cross because he would be disobedient to his father. So in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, the devil tries to stop Jesus then. Um, if you worship me, I'll give you all the cities of the earth, for they have been given to me, says the devil says to Jesus. And it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't say, that's a lie, that's not true. But it's absolutely true. The prince and power of the air in Ephesians 2, 2 is the devil. He is in charge of this earth. Now, obviously, God is ultimately in charge. 
But this is, where do we operate here mostly? In our flesh. Uh, and so the, the devil loves that. He has demons over every city um, and so on. He has a plan. He wants to destroy the earth. So anyway, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Peter's rebuke, and then you have the war in heaven. Um, and so that's a, from, from Eden all the way to Calvary. The devil's trying all he can, uh, even through Judas, to stop Jesus from going to the cross. So I just want to point that out, that there's many things, and this is why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He makes another attempt here in Mark chapter 8 through Peter to, to distract Jesus or to discourage Jesus from going to the cross. And so let's keep going. So then he called the crowd around him, Mark 8, 34. And, and along with his disciples said, listen, if any of you would come after me, he must deny himself. In other words, all your plans, everything, God must have priority in everything that you do. Deny yourself. Deny your plan of getting to heaven, which is by works, which we have nothing to offer. The only way we're getting to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So deny yourself. Deny your idea of your plans. Repent of your wicked ways. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross. Total identity with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Take up your cross and complete and utter identity with Jesus Christ and follow him. Follow me. Isn't it interesting, too, that Jesus is out front. He's not hiding behind. You know, a lot of the war generals and people that um, I dealt with in my former career, they always hid behind. They weren't out front. The enemy was always hiding in their castles and their palaces and letting the grunts go out and do the dirty work. But Jesus is out front. So we're taking up our cross as he took his and we're following him. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If this is all you have is right here, this brief 60, 80 years in time or 90 years, and this is all you're living for, better think. Think about that because you have 60 to maybe 90 years here on earth and you're going to have unlimited number in eternity. So what is it really worth working for? Everything here, as I do a funeral today, uh, you leave behind. Uh, Miss Brenda took nothing with her. She uh, Memories is all that's left behind of her. And everything that she's left is being, you know, people are going to take some of it or whatever. But it's over. It's gone. Everything you have, you're leaving here. It's not depressing. It's exciting. I, always, I also believe, I don't think you ever really die. I think you lay down your body. You put it into the grave. But your spirit is instantly with Jesus Christ. So, and you stand before judgment. It says, appointed for man once to die. After that, the judgment. And so, uh, just think about that. What are you living for on earth? Have a good time. Enjoy your life on earth. Make great memories, but make sure that your goal is always heaven first. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What good is it to be the richest man uh, uh, on earth or woman on earth only to leave it behind? And, and, and I know, and some of you probably know some very wealthy people who have passed and their houses are still here. Their homes are still here. They're um, just on and on. It, you leave it all behind. And so, and what could you give for your soul? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, well, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation, in other words, we've traded God. We've cheated on God for things of this earth. We've traded him for everything but what he has to offer us many times. So we're adulterous generation. And so if you're ashamed of God, he's going to be ashamed of you before the Father. Now, some men will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. And then just a little further, it says, I tell you the truth, some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. So just on that note, some people think, well, see, look, at he, he's, he's lying because he's never come back. And there's they're saying that people that are standing here We'll see the kingdom. Well, that didn't happen, Rob. Well, it did because actually what you see right after this is a transfiguration. So they are, these people standing here, the disciples, specifically the inner, inner three, Peter, James, and John, they're going to see the transfiguration. And that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ where he talks with Moses and Elijah. And, they're, and they see this and they hear the voice from heaven. They're seeing the kingdom. So it did happen. And then the other part of the kingdom would be what's left behind right now is the church. The bride of the, the of Christ, the bride uh, bridegroom is Christ. The bride is the church. We're part of the kingdom. So the, they will see the transfiguration, some of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, 
as they see him in his glory. And then the church left behind is the other part of that kingdom. So people will say, well, see that Jesus, these people died. None of them saw the kingdom. That's not true. When he was res resurrected, they saw the resurrected Christ um, and so on. So there's a lot there uh, to that verse. So yes, it did happen. And Jesus, Jesus was not lying. So anyway, some of them did see the kingdom. And you'll see that in the next Bible study. We're going to do Mark chapter 9. And that'll be the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. So I hope everybody has a great day. I um, hope you're following Christ. Um, don't be afraid of the gospel. Don't be afraid to give your life to Jesus. And if you're not ready to talk about it right away, just learn more. That's what Jesus said to these disciples. Don't go out and preach. There's no reason to go out and preach right away. Take your time. Get to know Jesus Christ. Enjoy the walk. Get some friends around you. Talk to them about Jesus. Pray together. And then grow until you have the capacity to go out and tell others about Jesus. And you don't have to be an expert on Scripture. Every individual has a story. And your story is very valuable. It's unique. It's only yours. It's from your perspective. And if you can share how Christ improved your life, that's, that's all you need to know. Share that story with other people until you have a greater knowledge of the Word of God. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Building within the disciples, finally a capacity to understand what he's doing, what he's here for, and the gospel that they're going to preach afterward. This is one of their first exposures to that. So hope everybody has a great day, and we'll see you all tomorrow.